we've got a fantastic panel um, who I'm going to invite in a moment to start us off. So Matthew Gould is Chief Executive of NHSX, which was established last year to drive forward the digital transformation and health and social, in health and social care. Dr. James Mountford is Director of Quality at the Royal Free London, and Professor Helen Margetts is Pro Professor of Society and the Internet at the University of Oxford, and also Programme Director for Public Policy at the Turing Institute. And so in terms of the theme for the session this morning, um, there's huge potential from digital, but uh, also challenges and a gap between what's the reality for patients and staff working in the NHS from some of the hype around what artificial intelligence and digital transformation can potentially do for us. So with our, our panellists, um, I'd like to invite you to to discuss the state of progress and what we want to achieve and, and, how, and how we can get there. Um, after each of the panellists has spoken, we're going to have an interactive discussion. We're going to be using Slido um, as well as putting your hand up. So if you want to uh, log on to Slido, then, then please, please do so. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have a great discussion. I'll just... First of all, I'll hand over to Matthew to start us off. When I was a teenager, I always thought it would be really cool to end up as the leader of a cult. So I was very excited when David referred to NHSX as a cult. Um, but having got over that initial moment of excitement, actually, um, I don't want NHSX to be a cult. And there's something very uncult-like about what it is and about why it was set up. It was set up eight months ago. I published a blog yesterday setting out what we've been doing in those eight months. But actually, at its heart is a really straightforward notion, a very uncult-like notion, which is one of the issues which has been getting in the way of getting technology right in health and care has been the fragmentation of levers into all sorts of different bits of the center. And fundamentally, NHSX is about pulling those levers together. We are both part of NHS England, NHS Improvement, DHSC, so we can align policies and budgets and programs and standards and so forth all in a single place. And to be clear, we are very keen that what we do and anything we support should be supported by evidence. It's why we are setting up an analytic unit precisely to do that. It's why we're helping to fund NICE's digital evaluation work precisely to do that. And one of the things I've realized in my time in the job is it's not actually a, the technology job I thought it would be. It's really a system job. It's about sorting out, it's about deconvoluting some of the systems, if that's a word, some of the systems that underpin and support uh, the NHS and that social care as it tries to make use of technology. And the more I've done the job, the more I've come to the view that if we can get those underlying systems right, slightly more banal, slightly more pedestrian, actually the innovation will then happen on top of it. Because one of the things I've become really clear is that the NHS doesn't have a problem with innovation. Every bit of the system I go to, every trust, every hospital, every GP surgery is filled with innovation, people doing things, brilliant, committed people doing things in new ways, creating, creating new ways of doing things. And we need to get the platform right so that innovation can flourish. So we've been doing a bunch of things, and I wanted very quickly to start off with just explaining some of the things we're doing so you get a sense of where our efforts are. Firstly, I wanted to start with the people side, because ultimately, actually, getting the technology right isn't about the technology. Lots of the technology we're talking about is not cutting edge, dramatically exciting technology. It's actually quite, in other sectors, very standard technology. It's about making sure the people are on side, the people have the confidence and the skills, and that the systems are supporting them. So I'm really keen that what we've called the soft stuff, but actually isn't that soft at all, giving people 
the skills and the, the, the confidence they need is an area of real focus for us. And we're working with HEE to really scale up the work we're doing on digital ready workforce, and that which is our term for, for, for all that agenda. And crucially, it's not about just the tech people in the system. I think we, there are a lot of people working in tech and data and analysis. I think we need to do a much better job with them in creating professions so that they have the support and the training and accreditation and kudos that they deserve and need. But I also think it's about the leadership. It's not just about the CIO and CCIO. It's about the chief executive and the board and the director of medicine and the head of nursing and so forth. And so our people work needs to focus much more widely. It's also not just about giving skills, it's about um, trying to hear from the front line and incorporate the views of the front line, which is when I start, why when I started in the job, she spent a month just going round as much of the NHS as I could, listening and seeing what, I, what, it was, what the ground truth was. So there's the people side. The second thing is we are starting a project which broadly call what good looks like. So that we set out clear, simple criteria for different sorts of provider in the system and in social care about what good and outstanding look like in the use of digital technology. Now, and our best guess for a few years in the future. So that there is hardwired into the way the system does things, the improvement methodology, CQC inspections and so forth, but also collectively a sense of what it is we ought to be doing. And allied to that is, a, is a, another piece of work which is, sounds incredibly banal, but I actually think is rather important, which is giving clarity around who pays for what. Because one of the things that I think has happened for good reasons, with good intentions, is there's been a series of uh, windfalls from the centre, which has, I think, accidentally had the impact of disincentivising planned long-term investment in the underlying systems and technology and networks and hardware that, that are needed. So one of the things I'm really keen we do over the next few months, all of this, by the way, co-created with the system, not imposed from the center. So I'm very, we'll be launching a big consultation and trying to, to, to make sure we, we really have talk around what the answer is, but creating clarity around who pays for what I think is key. We've got a big piece of work around standards, open standards. We want to have a catalog of open standards, whether it's technical standards so that systems can speak to each other, or standards around how things are described, whether it's sort of medicines or dosages or whatever it is, so that across the system, information can flow between systems, between different types of providers, because the systems are talking and things are being described in the same way. Another thing we're doing is I'm soon to announce the appointment of a commercial lead for NHSX. Because one of the things I've been struck by is across the system you have providers making big negotiations and purchases once in a generation across the table from providers who are doing these sales every week. And it's an asymmetric relationship. And so I'm keen to try and ease that asymmetry by creating a small function at the center, working very closely with NHSD and NHSE and others to, um, to make sure that we think about what should be negotiated and paid for nationally, what should be negotiated nationally but paid for locally, and then what, what we expect providers to buy themselves, what help we can give them to make sure we get that right. We're uh, the Secretary of State, um, we'll hear from later, has announced we're the next chapter of our provider digitization program, building on the, the global di digital exemplars, is um, a, a new program called the Digital Aspirant. So we uh, a program to help um, those who weren't part of the uh, GDE program get to a greater level of uh, digital maturity. One of the things that I'm really keen we do in that program is show that the governance associated with these programs can be really light touch. There's a, if there's a minimum we need to do to assure uh, that taxpayer money is being well spent, but in particularly bits of a system that don't have huge bandwidth 
to devote to this stuff. I want it to be spent on getting the substance right, not on filling out endless reams of paperwork from the center. So getting that right will be really key. And then we're just to say we are also working, part of our remit is emphatically in social care. So we've set up a, a, a team to look at what we can do in social care. And crucially, I think, again, the focus needs to be on standards so that information can flow between health and care and uh, in the sector. So um, we can try and break down some of the, 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 the silos between the two. All of this is really in the category of fixing the basics, making sure that we respond to the concerns that I and colleagues have heard from the system about the lived experience of technology. In some places, there's some brilliant practice, too much of a system, there are long login times and real um, frustration with the technology that people has to deal with, have to deal with. And so the things I've described, I hope, over time, will address some of that. And I think it's completely necessary we do that so we bring staff with us and tackle the, the things that people in the NHS and care actually worry about when they think about technology. I also think, though, it's not an either or do the basics or do the cutting edge stuff. We have to get the things I've described right if we are to create a platform on which innovation can flourish. And I think if we can do the things I've described, you start to build a foundation on which the potential benefits of technology can really start to be felt. And before I finished, I just wanted to mention, in particular, I've been asked to mention the potential of AI, where, as ever, with these technologies, there is a huge amount of hype. As ever, we tend to overestimate the short-term impact and underestimate the long-term impact. But where I do think it is striking that the more mature AI technologies, the more proven, peer-reviewed technologies are have the potential to have an impact in some of, the, some of the areas where there is most clinical pressure and strain in the system, and where we've been uh, given 250 million pounds to set up an AI lab, um, and where, where there are two elements of it I wanted to pull out. One is a fund to take some of the technologies that have been proven or have demonstrated themselves in individual locations, and scale them to six or eight locations so that we can start to build a proper evidence base more widely and show that they, or test whether they, they, they work in more than just the one location. And then the second element is making sure that we have a proper regulatory frame around this. So one of the things I did recently, one of the advantages of NHSX is we have a convening power so I convened the chief execs and heads of all the 14 regulators and agencies involved in AI regulation, including MHRA and CQC and, uh, and a range of others. And we spent half a day t working out a plan for how we make sure there is the right frame of regulation around this so that both uh, staff and professionals, citizens, and indeed innovators can have confidence that what they're doing is being done in the cover of sensible regulation. Um, final thoughts. None of this will work if tech is seen as something separate. If tech is seen as something for the IT department and everyone else can just get on with their job, it will fail. This, uh, the, the potential of technology to help deliver better outcomes in health and care will only be fulfilled if it is absolutely integrated, as it is to the long-term plan, as it will be to the people plan, to what NHS England is doing on outpatients and so forth. If, if in every bit of the system, uh, the, the digital element isn't seen as something separate, but is owned by the board and the chief exec and the director of, of medicine just as much as it is by the CIO and the CCIO. And then the final thing I'll say is, please, I want this to be a conversation. I really don't want to sit and skip and house and tell everyone what the answers are. I think that would be a catastrophe. So we, are, we will be fanning out around the system. We will continue to, I will continue to be spending as much of my time as I can on the road. I am really keen to hear, not just from the enthusiasts, but from the skeptics, and I am, 
entirely confident that I will be very shortly. Thank you very much. James, do you want to share your, your reflections? Thank you. So I look around the room, um, which does seem to get bigger every year at this uh, event, and I see lots of Tara in the front here who know a huge amount about digital, so I'm looking forward to getting a good conversation uh, going. Um, a couple of things struck me um, from a perspective on the ground at the Royal Free. So um, I guess... <clears throat> Picking up, Matthew, on your points in particular about tech not being separate and people. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about utility, bringing benefit, meeting a need. I want to talk about timing and the link of digital into um, some care redesign and improvement work that we're doing. And I want to talk about patients as well as our staff. Um, and I guess so we are one of the first uh, wave of the global digital exemplars and there's some digital stuff that's quite new that we are, I think, you know, seeing great benefit from and, and rightly proud of. But equally, if any of you have been a patient at the Royal Free recently, or um, I was just saying to Matthew, a couple of his relatives work at the Royal Free, and the daily experience uh, is not necessarily compatible with uh, the, the status of a, as a global digital exemplar. Um, so getting the basics right is, is, is really, really important. Um, so... Um, how is this useful to our caregivers? So we see digital uh, as, as a, one of three really big themes. Um, the other two being good management and clinical leadership and embedding a method of continuous improvement with, with care redesign. So digital and those other two um, as the ways in which we are trying to improve care. Um, so um, you'll find we're in the process of upscaling um, much of the digital across our hospitals. We have several and they're at different stages. Um, but um, people now are able to go to their clinic and have all their systems working within a minute rather than 15 minutes early. You have to go in order to fire up 12 systems and six different screens. And then you code uh, your, your notes four times, one for the letter to the GP, one for the patient record, one for your research database. So this type of integration to your point about um, standards. Um, and uh, you know, one of the really big things for our staff is about a, a single sign-on. So you tap your card and that signs you into all the things. And that's partially there, it's not, uh, not fully there. Um, clinical risk, patient safety, so um, certain risks that digital can bring, such as prescribing the, the wrong drug from a digital um, drop-down menu, but you can be sure that you're looking at the right patient's x-ray, for example. You can be sure that you're prescribing the right drug and the barcode um, scan for it. Although um, I, I first uh, did my first medical job <clears throat> almost half my age ago uh, in Winchester Hospital in 1998, um, and I can remember being able to prescribe from the doctor's mess there um, in a way that's only just coming to some of our services now. So that's quite interesting if you think about the 20 years of, of digitization uh, outside. Um, vital signs being coded straight into the record that links to the ability to predict and to spot risk. Many of you might have heard about our relationship at the, at the Royal Free with Google and the Streams app. So the Streams app um, looks at one condition, acute kidney injury, which is a, essentially the, the marker for it is a biochemical disturbance. And that's all about getting the, it's not actually AI, that, that's about getting the right information to the right person so that that condition can be prevented or at least uh, further progression of it can be prevented. Um, and you get the rather nice situation where the renal registrar through the Streams app is reviewing the patient before the home team might know that there's anything wrong. So that's an example of meeting a, 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 a staff and a clinical need. The information is sitting there in our results, but previously hasn't been available to care for the patient. So that's now flagged to the mobile phone um, of, the, of, the, of the relevant clinician. So... 
we're trying to stop wasting people's time and stop wasting their spirit through better uh, digital. Another thing we're doing at the Royal Free is um, redesigning uh, pathways. And um, we have these um, uh, things called clinical practice groups, which are redesigning pathways for our big uh, pathways of care. So hip replacement, uh, a standard birth, um, uh, we do a lot of hepatobiliary work. So about 70% of our clinical volume is going through the clinical practice groups. And one of the things we're doing under the GDE is digitizing those pathways, 20 in the, in the first instance. And um, if our orthopedic chief was here, um, he would tell you, and you know, they're, they're a pretty hard crowd to please, the, um, the, the, the uh, way in which he's able to order a set of pre-op workups and plan to the admission is now literally at the touch of a couple of buttons. Um, whereas previously that would take him 15 to 20 minutes. But the really important thing I think is about digitizing this at the point at which you have had your clinical teams redesign the care to the new pathway that you want. So if you bring in the digitization before you have got the momentum and the agreement around standardizing the pathway and embedding a method to improve it, um, then uh, you, you, you could be really stuck because what you'll do is rather than hardwiring in the things that you make it easy for people to do the things you want them to do, you hardwire in the, the variation uh, rather than taking it out. Um, and I mean, the, the thing which is most spectacular to me actually around this in dermatology, um, and this is your example of simple technology actually. So we uh, had, uh, still have access challenges, but um, dermatology spots, um, we have a high volume and the weights used to be in the you know, 30s, 40s of weeks and they're now down to four. By changing the pathway, this was patients in consultation with the staff who were doing the pathway coming up with these ideas. And if you're referred now, uh, rather than come to clinic with your spot, you go and see a medical photographer. Perhaps in future you can just take it on your own phone. Um, and then that is reviewed. And the number of people who actually go to a clinic is now only a fifth of what it was before. So you know, that, that's a, a, a kind of magnitude of improvement that I, I find just staggering. A um, couple of things about patients. So, uh, and again, on the theme of simple technology. So um, we've been working with an outfit called Care uh, Opinion. Um, I don't know if anyone's in the room from there, but what they do is, is they essentially take feedback and promote conversations. It's all web-based between clinical teams and the patients who are looking after them. And we've done a, a pilot um, in our um, neuro rehab unit um, which we want to extend, but the richness of this qualitative feedback. So the patients are commenting, the staff can clarify, they actually measure the uptake in the number of conversations that get created. And then those conversations get put into the team meetings and into the pathway design work that they're doing. And I think, you know, if, if, if you offered me a binary choice between ratings, quantitative ratings and this sort of dialogue, so you can only have one or the other, I would take the dialogue every time. Um, so, I'll, I'll probably stop there. There are loads of challenges. Uh, you know, not all of our staff are at the same level on the adoption curve. Many people feel slowed down rather than sped up. Probably everyone knows, you know, about the, the link between burnout and digital. Um, but uh, I think, uh, you know, I feel like we're in the foothills, but we're on the way. And I guess lastly, um, I totally agree with, with Matthew's point about um, uh, the, 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 just, just the link into um, wider operations. So when we no longer talk about digital is perhaps the time when it's really come of age. Thanks very much, James. And Helen, if I could ask you to give us a perspective from outside the health bubble. Sure. So I'm not a health specialist. I'm a political scientist, actually. So I was very pleased to hear Nigel Edwards mention, utter those words earlier. Um, but I do realize that anything I say is going to be treated with suspicion. Um, but I, I, I am a, an academic researcher who's always focused on the relationship between government and digital technology since the days when that was really quite a sad and lonely thing to do because nobody was interested in it. And I'm sure the same, I know the same was the same um, in healthcare as well. Um, 
And when the latest generation of data-intensive technologies um, came along, um, machine learning, agent-based modeling, and what has come to be called AI, although that is quite often referring to some kind of snake oil. Um, so we do have to be careful um, with that, although the Turing Institute is now the National Institute for AI. Um, so, of course, we, 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 we do use that. We, we, we use the term um, while having a bit of a health warning on it. Um, anyway, when this latest generation of technology came along, I was very keen to try and think of ways in which government as a whole could have a better relationship with the latest generation of technologies than it has um, with earlier ones. Um, and I wanted to share a bit of that experience to see if it was um, in uh, of interest here. Um, I should say before I start, just to reinforce um, the point that Matthew made about seeing technology as something separate. Nothing that I can say um, would ca about kind of things that we are doing, the things that we are working on with policymakers outside health can have any relevance unless there's domain expertise. Um, and that's what um, health professionals and policy policymakers, as somebody has accurately described the room, um, have. Um, and that's a very important point to make. Um, actually, no technology works in that, in, in that way, but particularly with data-intensive technology, you need that to domain expertise. Um, so we set up the pub public policy program almost two years ago now with the aim of thinking about how technology could make for better policy making, more equitable resource allocation, more efficient public services, um, and also how we could build an ethical framework to allow technology um, to flourish in achieving those objectives. Um, that's because before we started, we went around government talking to literally hundreds of policymakers um, across departments and agencies um, to find out what they were interested in and what they were worried about um, with the idea of, of um, data and technology. And at least half people's kind of interest and concern were about the ethical, moral, normative issues of using um, data and using technology. Um, and we felt that that was very important. There's a real sense, and this partly comes from the engineering world, um, the idea that ethics is a sort of uh, something to stop you doing things. Um, and I think it's certainly in the engineering, math, computer science world, it is really important to sort of reinvent um, ethics and the idea of an ethical framework as something which facilitates and which allows things to happen in um, an ethical way. Um, one of the things we discovered early on was the possibility of read across here in this area, that there are sort of generic things done in policy making and service delivery um, that, uh, that AI can help with. Um, and that is a, a perhaps why there's a read across from outside the NHS to, the, uh, uh, to, to, to here. I'll give you an example of that. Um, British government, as many most governments really, talk, thinks about things in quite a siloed way. And we discovered that in, in, in Bayes, the, the um, business energy uh, department, they were thinking about how to identify people at risk of fuel poverty. And their automatic sort of way of thinking about that was to go somewhere else in the department and use a model, um, a, a predictive model, uh, which came from uh, I, the, the need to identify um, uh, startups with a, a, a potential for high growth. Now, if you think about it, that's not a good place to go. The, the questions are different. The, um, it's a, apart from anything, it's a sort of organizational thing rather than an individual thing. Um, yet, lots of agencies, including in the NHS, are working on good, innovative ways to identify vulnerable groups. So D D DWP would be doing that to identify people at risk of, of, of food poverty, of not, not having enough food. Um, uh, communities and local government department is looking at ways of identifying who's vulnerable to homelessness. Um, at the Turing, we have a project on, on, on modern slavery, looking at, with the Home Office, looking at where people might be vulnerable to exploitation. 
So that's something that a lot of agencies want to do, and it's something that predictive models um, might be able to help with. Anyway, I, I guess our experience has, has kind of led to three things that we're concentrating on, where we feel that there's the most early possibilities, and I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So one of them is um, simulation and evaluation. I've heard policy evaluation um, mentioned a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of times here. And I think methodologies which involve agent-based modeling, a, a, a methodology, after all, that has a very, very long history in economics, goes back to the 70s, as indeed does AI in the expert systems um, field, but was, never worked very well because it was based on very small quantities of data. So it was really a kind of toy modeling system is something that can be used to simulate public policies before actually um, putting them into action and experiencing unintended consequences. Um, it's a way of modeling that uses actual data rather than rules about how all the agents in a system are going to behave. We have a project working um, with police forces looking at how we can model the consequences of different levels of police resourcing without actually um, experiencing kind of basically not having enough um, police, which of course is another way of, of, of doing it um, and has been tried, of course. Um, and, and of course, there is a, a, a great potential read across there for health agencies in, in, in terms of um, uh, what, what they might, uh, what, what uh, health agencies might do with agent-based modeling and the question of resources. The second thing is um, measurement detection and prediction, which is what you have the potential of getting from ma machine learning um, technologies. And after all, a lot of people say that AI is either machine learning or, or PowerPoint. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, <laughs> machine learning is being used in all sorts of ways. We have a project looking at hate speech, for example, how to measure and detect hate speech. A lot of read, read across there for the possibility of detecting um, misinformation and networks of misinformation like the anti-vax movement in the health field. So a lot of, a lot of possible read across there. Lots of uh, cases of where machine learning is being used for measurement and detection, again, of vulnerable groups. But then there's the question of prediction, risk-based models, um, which a couple of people have mentioned, to predict um, where things are going to go wrong or, or, or where things are going to go well. A lot of local authorities in the country are already using um, machine learning to uh, identify um, what demand is going to be for schools, for um, places in, 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 in childcare, for all kinds of social welfare needs. And of course, at the aggregate level, that's quite a non-controversial thing to do. But as soon as local authorities are told that um, uh, uh, the, the, this number of children will be at risk, for example, of course, they want to know which children. And that leads me to my last point, which is the question, this, going back to this question of ethics. Because, of course, that is a very morally difficult question to answer. It also point, points to um, the question of who's providing these technologies, as somebody um, made earlier. Um, uh, because if some company, which may be more or less scrupulous, is providing that technology, what will they do when a local authority says which children? What if there's 60% chance that a child is going to be taken um, into care or is at risk in some way? What do you do with that probability? It's a very difficult question. If it's 90%, what do you do? That's another difficult question, but a diff different one. If it's 60%, should you even pretend that you don't have that information? Is there anything you can do with it? So these are difficult questions. And the last thing that we're really working on um, is this question of ethics. Can you build a framework that actually gives policymakers a practical guide to what you do in those kind of situations, how you tackle questions like fairness, um, uh, uh, accountability, sustainability, and transparency. There are ways around those things, but it is a kind of reasonably complex exercise to come up with something that can be practically used. And I think we, we all ought to tr treat that as a, as, as a priority um, in concert with the uh, use of, of technology. 
Thank you very much, Helen. Well, I think um, our panellists have given us a really uh, rich theme of ideas to, to think about. So um, you can ask questions uh, putting your hand up or via Slido. Um, I guess I just wanted to perhaps kick off and have a question myself for the panel, um, which is how you think technology might change the relationship between patients and, and clinicians or, or patients in the health service. I don't know any volunteers to uh, offer their thoughts on, on that one. Everyone seems to be looking at me. <laughs> um, I suppose the place I would start is, is the relationship that we have in our pockets now with perhaps the next train ticket we want to book or <clears throat> Um, the shopping that we want to do, um, I can remember thinking, goodness me, there's absolutely no way that I am going to enter a debit card information into a website. And that came somewhat after a stage where I thought there is no way that I'm ever going to enter credit card information into a website. Now, of course, I've now got multiple of both stored in my pocket with a finger click away. So, why do I do that? Because it meets the need. It saves me time. It gives me what I want. And I think uh, a world where your healthcare information, um, relevant data is shared between patient and the clinical team supporting them can only drive uh, extraordinary uh, benefits for both, both in the management of individual patients, but also in how we design um, the, the, the service and, and remove the waste from it. So I agree with that. Um, I think, I mean, I'd say two things. And one is, yes, if we can give the patient the information and the tools to, to be partners in driving their care, um, and that's not just for the sick, but the, 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 the tools to, to stay healthy, I think that could be extremely powerful. We have Polly here on my team who's been brilliantly leading the... The, the team on the NHS app, which I think is uh, there's a, a real potential to, to help with that journey. There's another element, though, that I wanted to mention, which is if we can do some of the things we've been talking about, um, in very straightforward ways, we ought to be able to give clinicians time back, which they will then be able to spend with their patients. So technology ought to help relieve some of the huge amounts of time that nurses spend preparing meds, for example, or clinicians right across the board spend trying to either enter or access information. Um, there's, a, there's a huge slice of time that we steal from our clinicians with all this, and I think if we can give that time back, it will have a profound effect on the ability of clinicians to connect with and help and uh, care for their patients. Thank you. Well, one thing I would say there is that I think we are getting better in having some kind of science of, of, of public um, involvement in these kind of, of, of things. We are getting better at asking uh, at understanding what people want from, from technology, the sort of um, process of working out what people want to be explainable, for example, and what they don't. Um, uh, we hear a lot of talk at the moment about citizens' assemblies. Citizens' juries have got much better. We've gone beyond things like focus groups um, and towards things that do have some kind of um, scientific cre credibility there. Thanks very much. So I think I'll go to the questions that are coming through on Slido. So um, a question here about um, approaches to preventing digital from exacerbating health inequalities. Um, Matthew, would you like to comment on that one? Yeah, so look, I think there are, it's a perfectly legitimate question. And I went to one, spent a day with one GP surgery in the, the north of England who had very kindly put together a group of their patients uh, to spend an hour telling me how much they really didn't want to use digital technology. And it was actually extremely useful to hear. Uh, because I think there are two points. One is the digital technology has to be accessible. It has to be not just for the sort of digitally confident and the, the digital natives, but 
the technology itself, as far as it is possible to be, has to be accessible, intuitive, straightforward to use, which is why we're determined to try and get patients in the design, in the governance, in the leadership of the programs, the program level, indeed, at the, in my senior leadership team as well. Um, but then also, I think we need to accept that not everyone is going to be able to or wants to use digital tools. So there have to be channel, non-digital channels that are as good and as accessible. And that doesn't, I don't, I, that shouldn't mean not doing the digital, but I think it means when you do it, it you have to have accessibility absolutely front of mind and test what you do against it. And you have to make sure that there is a non-digital alternative available. I think at its best, technology has the ability to allow a system to focus on those who most need the attention by dealing with those who need, don't need that attention in other ways. Um, at its worst, if we're not careful, you, the, you exacerbate inequalities because there are digital haves and have-nots just as there are health have and haves and have-nots. And there is always a danger. It's a very good question because there is always a danger unless this is really front of mind in what you do that you just exacerbate that, that inequality. So, so I'm, I'm minded, a number of us will have heard um, Victor Deverwell talking about the, the key things that healthcare needs and he talks about access and equity and technology as a key enabler um, but it can obviously take both of those in, in good or bad directions. Just an example from a conversation with one of our diabetologists on, on this. Um, so um, two things that, that she said that, that I found quite interesting. One um, is don't forget how much people struggle, often the most complex and people living in the most difficult conditions with the most difficult disabilities to get to a clinic. And so actually moving to Skype consultations, in her view, was not only reducing the inequality of access, but actually, this was the really interesting bit that I'd not thought of at all, was flipping the power relationship between the two of them. Because she was in her office, the patient was in her home, not that the patient had struggled for three hours to come to sit in a waiting room for then a magical door to open to then be on the doctor's mm -hmm. turf. So that was one aspect of it. And then in, in, the, in the same clinic, um, the level of ownership that a patient can get to their condition if they've got a, a you know, real-time blood sugar streaming coming onto their phone um, can lead people who previously might have wondered what it was all about to actually become highly active. I'm just going to take a couple of questions from the floor, although there are some really great questions coming through. Uh, Theo, I can see your... So it was about the health inequality. So I've got the experience of trying to embed the MyCOPD app, um, which uh, has been touted as extremely, extremely useful. And initially, certainly, um, trying to embed MyCOPD app within community respiratory teams in Leeds was a disaster um, because many of our patients were living in abject poverty, very chaotic lives. It was not something that they could utilize or use in any way. And it was a very small minority of people who were able to utilize that technology. What's been interesting is actually wrapping around a digital inclusion team, which is the council's team, a great deal of support and help and advice. We are able to embed it a lot further. But I think the point I would like to make is therefore the cost and the um, change and the cultural change that's needed to embed a new bit of tech to, in order to ensure that it doesn't increase health inequalities is absolutely huge um, and, and needs to be considered in all of this. Thanks here. Claire and... Uh... Thanks very much. I just want to make two points. With respect to health inequalities, it can actually reduce health inequalities with our... <laughs> Uh, we have an e-consult, e e-triage system, and in fact, 
the, what we find are those with mental illness, those with sexual health problems, those where English isn't their first language, are very frequent users because they can actually get their child, their, their adult child uh, with them to try and uh, communicate with their GP. And they can also do it in, in their own time. So I think it, it, we've got to look at it at different ends because it can improve inequalities and it can reduce inequalities, other than, of course, that very small number of the population who don't have access at all to a smartphone. But the second point I wanted to make, I thought you would say, and I was waiting for it, when you said digital and, uh, will help uh, reduce the time that the doctor or the nurse spends on this and therefore allow them more time for, and I was waiting for the themselves, because actually what I think digital not with their patients. Now, of course, we need to have more time with our patients, but the one thing that's so really lacking that digital hopefully will try and improve is the amount of time that doctors and nurses can spend actually reflecting on their work, having space to do their work properly, having uh, uh, breaks, which they're, I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room has, you know, is on the golf course every day play, uh, not working. So I think we've also got to accept that it's beneficial for the staff not to spend more time with their patients, not to open another lane of the motorway so that they're just working just as hard but in a different place, but actually more time with themselves or with uh, reflecting on their own workload. Uh, there was another question just on the same table. Thank you. It's Charles Alessi from Public Health England and HIMSS. Um, one is, that t t I think we need to address this inequalities issue head on because I think um, um, the points made around inequalities are perfectly valid, but perhaps the language we use is not the most conducive uh, to all uh, strata of society, and we need to understand that. And also, the medical language we use is medical language. Uh, we can learn an awful lot from even people which we hitherto have perhaps not ever engaged with, and the gaming industry, for example, that somehow found it extraordinarily easy to get people to do the most unnatural things, which is put money on um, horses in a way whereby they don't even get the thrill of the race through the internet. And some of the ways and behavior and methods that they have used uh, have actually been employed towards the delivery of health and care in wonderfully imaginative ways. And we've seen this being deployed in um, different parts of the world, not yet in the United Kingdom. The second point I wish to make is about burnout specifically about burnout. There is a, a conf there is, people um, talk about digital transformation as being equivalent to burnout. Now, uh, I think there is a connection between the two because digital transformation equals change of pathways, equals change of ways of working, equals a whole series of issues where inevitably, unless that is very perfectly managed, it just increases the stress on the individual. Burnout is also associated with everything from uh, uh, Dr. Google to the enormous amount of information around pathways that people now have to uh, take uh, in. In my day as a young practitioner, all I had to do when I was on my emergency take, I had a few drugs in my hands, and I had to make sure that people um, were warm, were comfortable, were not in pain, and preferably within chair the, the bed with the person next to them. But that's basically it until the morning. Now there are pathways for everything, not only for everything, but for different people within everything. And it is outside of reality for humans to be able to cope with all of that, unless there are well-developed clinical decision support systems, digitally, which follow a clinical pathway rather than an administrative one. This is a long conversation, but digital is our future if we deploy it correctly, or a disaster if we don't. And I'm really pleased that Matthew is in listening mode around the de deployment, because that's going to make the big difference. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to take another couple of questions, because there's lots of hands up. So try and hold some thoughts, then I'll ask you for reflection. So, Alison. Thank you very much. My name's Alison Lear. I'm a professor of modelling. Um, I'm really interested in the assumptions that are being made around work. So it's, it's, it's a bit from Claire's point, actually. So we know that in the past in other industries when there's been digitisation, the work hasn't got less, it's just become different. And I was really intrigued by a couple of the comments about how nursing work was changed. I'm sitting on the nursing table here. <laughs> um, Particularly the stuff around the automation of vital signs. So it assumes I, I get contacted pretty much every week by some SME that's cracked safe staffing or cracked safety. Um, 
So the collection of vital signs just as data, absolutely. But we know, I mean, there was, there was quite a big study by um, it was somebody funded by NHR about 18 months ago that registered nurse actually doing vital signs as opposed to a healthcare assistant collecting data is better for patient outcomes. So when we're talking about this digitization agenda, are we really considering, as Eric Holnagel would say, the work is done, not the work is imagined? So perhaps we'll just pause there for reflections on those. And then I know we've got a couple of other hands that have been up. Any wonder you'd like to comment on those points? Matthew. So look, there's a ton there. Can I just give a series of, of thoughts? So um, the My COPD app story, I thought, was really interesting. And for me, I think there are two lessons I draw from it. One is there are definitely some applications which we know when they're effectively deployed can have a very positive benefit in terms of freeing up time, uh, productivity, and so forth. Um, but often, the bits of the system that most need the benefit from that aren't the bits that have the bandwidth to be able to deploy it. So Tara Donnelly, our CDO who's sitting at the front, is um, standing up. And we're working out and listening and talking to people about how we do this, but standing up a cap capability to assist with the deployment. Um, or, so precisely so the bits of a system that most need the benefit of, the, of those technologies can, can get the benefit. Uh, but there's another lesson as well that I draw from that story, which is I don't think collectively we do an optimal job at sharing what we know and what we our experience. Partly because everyone's very busy, partly because we don't have the mechanisms in place to share it, partly because it's, I'm not convinced everyone is comfortable standing up and saying, yeah, we tried this and it didn't work. And here's why it didn't work and here's the lessons we draw from it. And there's a question about blame culture and I am really, it's something I feel very strongly about. Until we can say, actually we tried something and it didn't work, it will be very hard to get this right. Um, the question, the point about time, Claire's question about time and time back, I mean, I totally take the point I think the, it is nonetheless really worthwhile to try and liberate that time. But I am still haunted by a, uh, something I heard, which actually wasn't anything to do with technology. But I was t listening to a survivor of domestic abuse. And she had been suffering domestic abuse for years. And she said the moment she felt she had permission to say, yes, I have been the victim of domestic abuse, was when the GP looked her in the eye and said, gosh, what you've just described to me sounds like it must have been very difficult. And if the GP had not looked her in the eye but had been looking at the computer screen trying to pull up information, that exchange would never have happened. So one way or another, I think there's a role for us to do to give clinicians the ability to spend that time with the people they're looking after. The, the last two points, I think, for me are really about the necessity of making sure everything we do is designed with the user at its center. That when the, the idea that you can come up with a brilliant system and chuck it over the wall at the clinicians is hopeless. It has to be user-centered design. There are some, as Helen has talked about, there are some really good techn uh, techniques and methodologies that have been developed for doing this. We get it right when we deploy those technologies. We do, we, we, we look at work as it is rather than we, when we imagine it when we use those methodologies. Thank you. Any, Helen? I just wanted to come back at that point about imagined work because I think this quite often happens. We compare what the technology is doing with some imagined Halician past where we were doing everything perfectly. And what the technology quite often does is, that, particularly the data intensive ones, is they reveal what was happening before. So there's a lot of talk about bias in machine learning arising from the training data being biased. And this is quite often the case, but that, 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 I mean, that can be the case. But the bias reflects bias that was in the system before, in the kind of human system, that's been reflected in the data and reinforced in the technology. So there is a sense there that the technology can sort of highlight those things 
um, and perhaps make it easier to do something about it in the future. But it's a really good point about imagined work, because I think we do kind of imagine how things were before. I, I think it's Sorry. mostly been said. I mean, you could go on to any ward at Barnet Hospital, one of our um, hospitals that recently had the upgrade, and you could find doctors and nurses there and therapists who think that the change has given them half their time back. And you could find on the same ward, same type of staff who think that it slowed them down hugely. Thank you. So there was a question um, on, the, on the second table and also at the back, in the middle of the back. Saraya Sitao, NHS dentist. Um, you mentioned that the AI will be targeted to where there are areas of strain and pressure. Um, how will you determine that? Because I feel everywhere there's strain and pressure. Will it be on a macro level, so like deprivation, or will it be on a systems level, or will it be on procedures? And based on the previous session, how will you ensure that that is scalable to the populations? And then a final question, if you don't mind, which is a bit cheeky, is... Do Helen and Matthew talk? Thank you. <laughs> Shall we just... We'll just hear the other question, uh, the other questioner, because you may also have multiple questions, and then I'll ask my panel to deal with it all. OK, thank you. Eileen Burns, I'm a geriatrician in Leeds, um, uh, and I work partly um, in Thea's organisation as well as in the Acute Trust and the community, so we have got quite good... I'm here, Matthew. We've got quite good systems that actually do allow me to see quite a lot of what's going on in other parts of the system. So that's a real positive thing. It's still clunky. It's still not as easy as we'd like it to be, but it's good. Um, on the health inequalities front, I just wanted to flag up the issue of older people, um, who we know are the main users of health and social care systems. Um, they're, the quick, they're the group who are learning fastest, the biggest growing learners for digital but there's still a huge amount of older people who don't have access to those technologies and are afraid of those technologies and really aren't going to go there. So I think we can see massive advantages in terms of how the system could work in a more integrated and effective way for older people. But in terms of the older people themselves being expected to use systems to book, for example, GP appointments, we need to just be really mindful that we don't disadvantage them. And then my final thing was, can we make all GPs whether they're on System 1 or EMIS, all be on the same system. <laughs> OK, so a few different points there. Matthew, are you happy to kick off Yes. Those? Uh, let me start with the easiest one. Helen and I do talk. <laughs> um, I mean, not so often it makes my wife nervous, but we, we, we've, we've been working together, in not just in my current role, but in my previous role when I was Director General for Digital Policy for the government. Um, your first point about um, how we, the, the areas that we're chosen to support for in, in AI with the fund. Well, it's an open fund with open application uh, with two bits. One is a, a bit where we want to support uh, innovation that has the needs, uh, has the, has shows real promise, um, but hasn't yet uh, sort of reached a point of maturity. The bit I was talking about that you referred to is the second part, which is a, a larger bit of a fund, which is to take technologies which have, where there is a serious evidential base of efficacy in, in, in what they do in individual, normally one or possibly two locations, and scale it to more locations. So there, I mean, an example would be the ability to, to read mammograms, um, where there is... Uh, there, there's decent evidence, but for us to deploy it much more widely, we need to see it works in a series of different locations. So it's about building that evidential base. Uh, so that's the way, way round we're doing it. Um, the point about care of the elderly, I mean, I totally agree. I spent a very happy hour and a half earlier this week giving evidence to a House of Lords Select Committee on exactly this question where the Science and Technology Committee is looking at the use of data and technology and care of the elderly. And I think their report will be really exciting and interesting precisely because it will tackle the needs, the, the constraints and the potential for, to, to help that particular bit of the population. On the point about the, all GPs using the same system, 
I can see the attraction, but I have to say my blood runs cold a bit thinking about a single system for the entire country because that's when you get really strong lock-in. It's when you get provider, a provider who doesn't have to be responsive to, to user need because they've got the monopoly. It's when actually things stop moving. So you get an immediate benefit in the short term because everyone's on the same system. And then I think things get worse because you don't have the, the pressure of having different providers. So I think the answer is not a single provider. I think the answer is really clear standards that all providers have to obey so that data can flow, so that things are described in the same way. And then actually you can have the benefit of having different providers and you don't get stuck with a single one. Thank you very much. Now, I'm conscious that we're nearly out of time, so I don't know, James or Helen, if you've got any final reflections for us. So, David, in the session earlier this morning, mentioned the four-hour ED target and how it's not particularly helpful to judge an ED or, let's say, a whole hospital by that number. Um, what we're trying to do across our pathways is to say in heart failure, just as an example, what does good look like across four dimensions, clinical outcomes, the patient ex experience, the health of the population, and the use of resources. And we're adding in staff experience into that. And you, you just, without digital, you just can't get reliable real-time information on those metrics that matter. So the, there's little that I see that's more powerful or inspiring than when a group of a clinical team together with their, their patients and families have come up with this set of metrics and we can offer them that and how they're doing and see what they're testing and changing links to how they're doing on those metrics. That is incredibly powerful. Yeah, just to that last question, I, I, I think the question of, of whether elderly people are, are never going to use a technology, for example, that, that is an ethical question which does have to be built into the use of the technology. Um, and it, it does come back to the ethical point. We have to break down ideas like fairness and say, you know, there's fairness in the data, which can cause bias, for example. There's fairness in the process, which would apply in this case, and then there's fairness in the outcome. We've got to be able to measure that outcome. And, and yeah, we have to confront that. Well, thank you very much to our panel. I hope you'll all join me.